Uh, hi, class. This is uh, Professor Watson. Welcome back to uh, LGLA 1351. This is Contracts. Uh, this week, we are talking about Chapter 10 on uh, performance. Uh, we're going to try this a little bit different. Instead of using the Blackboard uh, recording feature, uh, we'll, uh, we'll try this way, and I'll try to get this posted to see if this works better. I know that we lost a couple, uh, a couple of our uh, connections, and so uh, uh, a couple of our links. I'm trying to get those fixed this time, okay? Uh, so, um, uh, so this week, I hope you looked at the notes, uh, the lecture notes. I hope you've read the chapter already, but we're talking about uh, performance, okay, performance. Um, uh, what do you, uh, performance is, is what you have to do in order to satisfy a contract, right? Performance may be as easy as, as paying the money that's required. Um, or if somebody has, you know, hired you to clean their house, then your performance would be cleaning the house um, or mowing a yard or, or building a building or acting in a movie, right? Um, uh, performing uh, legal medical services, right? All of those things would be performance. Um, and, uh, and specifically, um, this week we're going to be talking about things that might excuse performance, okay? So um, you may have, uh, 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 we've gotten to this point, right? We're this far in the semester. We've talked about the, uh, the requirements of a contract. We've talked about how a contract is formed. Uh, we've talked about various elements of a contract, consideration and mutuality, those kind of things. We've even talked about the parties to a contract. So now we're, we're finally to a contract, right? Um, except now we're going to be talking about uh, uh, things that, that might excuse performance, all right? So you might think that you have a valid contract, um, and so you might think that both parties are now required to do what, they're, what they've promised, right? Um, but, but do they? Do they have an excuse? Let me see if uh, I can um, see if I can share the uh, um, PowerPoint here. We'll get started this way. So uh, the idea is you, you think you formed a valid enforceable contract. And, and now you have to do what you promised, right? Um, in this chapter, we'll be talking about you, or, or do you, or, or is there an exception? Right? Sometimes a failure to perform under a contract is not actually a breach. That's what we're talking about in this chapter. Sometimes failure to perform on a contract, to do what you promised to do, is not actually a breach because sometimes that performance may be excused, okay? Your, your performance may be, even though you've signed a contract, your performance may be excused. And this week, we're going to, we're, we're going to discuss the situations uh, in which performance might be excused, okay? Uh, now, next week, we're going to talk about the remedies, uh, what, what happens if somebody breaches a contract or if, if someone's performance is excused. So, so don't get those confused right now. Just because your performance is excused doesn't mean you're completely off the hook, right? Maybe you have a valid reason um, for, uh, for to excuse your performance, but you may have to you may have to make a reimbursement, right? You may have to return the money or something like that. We're not talking about that uh, this week, right? Now we're just talking about the, 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 various, uh, the, the various circumstances that might excuse performance. Next week, uh, next chapter, we'll talk about um, uh, what the remedies might be, wh whether it's because uh, uh, performance was excused or even if you breached, but we'll talk about remedies next week, okay? Um, let me point out at the very beginning though, before we move any farther, before we get, get any further into even the chapter, it is important to understand that, that, that contract law is not tort law, okay? Contract law is not about what was right or what was wrong. There's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a whole string of case law that tries to, that tries to distinguish a performance or breach of a contract from, from things like moral or ethical failures, okay? There's a whole line of, of case law going back decades that, that, that talks about the, the idea of an efficient breach, okay? That, that perhaps sometimes it might be in everyone's best interest if the contract was breached, or it might, it might lead to the greater good if a contract was breached, all right? So um, breach of a contract, not always a bad thing, um, uh, but you have to know, um, you have to know when, you're, when you're permitted to do it, uh, when you might be excused, or if you're not excused, what, what, what that breach may lead to, right? Um, it, the, 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 the contract, uh, the law generally looks at contracts and breach of contracts as it, it's business, right? You either followed through on the contract or you didn't. And if you breached the contract, then, then you have to pay accordingly, not because you're a bad person, but because that's what the contract calls for. Um, and so we'll talk about those remedies uh, for, for breach of contract next week. And those can be very important, right? Because uh, when you're making a business, a valid business decision, right? Should I honor this contract? Should I follow through? 
you need to know what the other side of that is, right? If I follow through the contract, then I know what I'm required to do. If I don't follow through with the contract, then what will, be I, what will I be required to do so that I can balance those things and see which one makes more sense, okay? Uh, but this week we're talking about, um, about performance and about um, uh, different, uh, different circumstances that might excuse performance, all right? Uh, the very first one we're going to talk about is a, a discharge due to unmet conditions. A discharge due to unmet conditions. Now, uh, we've already talked, you may remember weeks ago, we talked about conditions precedent, right? Things that, things that had to happen before someone's obligation under a contract was triggered, right? Um, and we talked about that, uh, um, uh, that some performance could be contingent and it would still be a valid contract. There would still be valid consideration, right? Remember, those were those, uh, those insurance type contracts, those insurance type contracts where, uh, you know, you pay your premium every month um, and the insurance company is supposed to pay uh, you back if you have a wreck uh, and you never had a wreck. And so the insurance company never had to pay anything. So did you really have a contract? Uh, there was no consideration, right? There was no give or get on both sides. And we discussed how, yes, that is still a valid contract because even though the insurance company's required performance was contingent, it was based on a concrete, verifiable uh, occurrence, right? If you have a wreck, then they have to pay. And they, um, and they stood ready to do that. And as long as, um, as long as they paid if you had a wreck or they, they at least stood by and you never had a wreck, um, uh, then you have a contract. Um, but what about that duty to pay? Uh, that duty to pay is based on a condition precedent, namely you having an accident, right? Are you becoming liable? Um, so a condition precedent is something that must occur before another party's performance is required. And so the concept here is really pretty simple, right? If the contract has a condition precedent, and if that condition precedent has not occurred yet, uh, then the performance is excused. Um, or I guess technically the performance was never really required in the first place, right? Um, it depends on how you look at the performance. And that in that insurance contract case, um, is, the, is your car insurance company, is their performance to pay if you have an accident? Or is their performance to stand ready to pay if you had an accident, right? If we look at it that way, well, then they've performed the whole time. They've stood ready. Um, but because you never had an accident, their, their duty, that, that second performance, that duty to pay, uh, was never triggered. And so it is excused, okay? It's excused. And, and that, that, uh, if that triggering event never happens, then their performance may never be required. It may, it may be excused forever. Right? Now, uh, be careful when you look at, uh, at, at cases or, or, or problems or circumstances where you may have um, a, a potential discharge due to unmet conditions, right? The harder question is not really whether the condition has been met or not. I mean, sometimes that's a fact issue, but you know whether you had a wreck or not, that's something that we can uh, we can determine pretty easily. But sometimes the question is, um, is it a, a is it actually a condition precedent that, that we're looking at, or is it just another promise? Right? Uh, if, if if somebody just hasn't lived up to all of their promises in the contract yet that doesn't necessarily mean it's a condition precedent, right? Are, are they required to do all these things before you have to act or do they have obligations and you have obligations and they just haven't met all of their obligations yet, okay? Uh, because it may be different. If it is a legitimate uh, condition precedent, then until that condition precedent is met, their, uh, their performance is excused. But if it's really, they've got four or five different, you know, they've got four or five different uh, um, things that they're supposed to do, and they've only done four of them, that doesn't necessarily excuse your performance, right? That may just be a partial breach. Um, so you've got to be really careful when you're looking at determining is something a condition precedent or is it just another contractual requirement, okay? And we'll talk about contract interpretation and, and you know, what you would look at, how you would determine those things, how you would read the document to try to, um, uh, to make that determination later on. Uh, we'll look at that in, I think, chapter 12. Uh, but for right now, uh, suffice it to say that, that for purposes of this chapter, um, if your performance is based on a condition precedent, and if that condition precedent has not been met yet, then your performance is excused. However, be careful that that's really a condition precedent and not just another, another element of performance on the other side, because just because they breach the contract, if it's a partial breach, that doesn't necessarily mean that your performance is excused, so be careful. Okay. Um, 
One kind of random thing your book throws in here in this chapter is a QI-TAM lawsuit. You may have seen that. It's on the screen right there. Q-U-I-T-A-M, a QI-TAM lawsuit. Um, I don't know that that necessarily goes in the performance chapter, but we can certainly talk about it here. And um, uh, so let, let me give you a brief idea of what a key TAM lawsuit is, just so that you understand what it is. And just so um, if, uh, if after you complete your coursework, you, you go to work and, and somebody brings up a, a situation arises or somebody brings up the idea of a key TAM lawsuit, at least you'll have a context and you'll know what it means. OK, um, a key TAM lawsuit is a. Um, is a lawsuit that a, a citizen uh, files on behalf of the government. Okay, it's a key TAM lawsuit. Um, and the idea is this, that, um, that there's a lot of stuff going on, right? And there's a lot of people doing business with the government. And if somebody breaches a contract with the government, then generally the government has a right to look at that and, and sue them to get their money back, right? But what if the government doesn't? And who knows why? The government's fast and complicated, and who knows what department or what bureau or what manager or what agent should be looking at that. Uh, but let's say that, a, a, that, that someone has breached a contract with the government or, or committed a tort against the government, something like that, and the government has not sued. Well, the idea here is that it would be in the public interest if, if you and I were aware of that and the government didn't do anything about it, that, that maybe you and I should go sue on behalf of the government and try to get that money back for the breach. Or if it's a tort suit, uh, let's say it's a fraud suit, uh, somebody's defrauding Medicare, right? That, that comes up a lot. Some, you're working at a doctor's office and you find out the doctor's office has been overbilling Medicare. Um, and, and what do you do? You, you feel like you've got an obligation, so you tell Medicare about it and still nothing happens. You know, they still don't sue the doctor back. You're like, wow, this is a lot of money and I'm a taxpayer. What should I do? Um, well, you could file a key TAM lawsuit. In other words, you would file a lawsuit on behalf of the government to try to enforce those contract rights or to, to, try, to, to try to enforce, uh, try to bring suit for those tort claims and get a recovery for the government. Um, and then if you do, and if you're successful, then the idea is a, as, a, as a public, we're all better off, right? Because you went out there and looked out uh, for the public good. Um, why in the world would you do such a thing? Well, the, the obvious answer is because in a key TAM lawsuit, a successful plaintiff is, is usually allowed a fee, right? Their attorneys are allowed a recovery. And they can, and so, um, so usually a key TAM lawsuit is about the, the attorneys who filed it uh, getting paid. And, and hopefully, I mean, they hope that's the reason they, that they file it, they get paid pretty well. Um, but, uh, but that's a key TAM lawsuit. A key TAM lawsuit is where a private individual, a citizen, file suit on behalf of the government to try to, to, to collect or, or to, to get back something on behalf of the government. Um, and in exchange, you get paid your attorney's fees, you get paid a little bit of a fee for that. Now, it's a, it's a complicated procedure, okay? Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of federal rules on it, but it starts with, uh, it starts with you have to notify the government that you think they have a claim, right? And then the government gets, the, gets to make the decision about whether they're going to, to file the suit or not. Um, and if they choose not to file the suit, then you can file suit, okay? But you got to be careful uh, because if you file the suit um, and if you do really well, the government can always decide to jump in and can actually take it over from you. Um, so key TAM lawsuits can be a little bit tricky, but that's what a key TAM lawsuit is. Uh, your book puts it in here. I wanted to make sure that you understood what it was about. Uh, many lawyers, many legal professionals go their entire career without never seeing or hearing of a key TAM lawsuit, uh, but if you if you go to work for a, a plaintiff's firm, for instance, uh, then it may come up um, and it may be something that you see. So I want you to understand what it means. All right, let's get back to chapter 10 though. Chapter 10, uh, well, it was in chapter 10, but let's get back to the, the, this idea of performance and specifically uh, conditions that might excuse performance, okay? Um, the, the second, the first category is that, is that um, uh, discharge due to unmet conditions, right? Those conditions precedent. Uh, the second uh, uh, circumstance that would excuse performance is, um, if I can get our screen to scroll here, is a discharge by agreement, by agreement, right? Maybe the parties just agree you don't have to perform. Uh, the parties could agree to excuse performance uh, by, uh, by several, different, um, uh, uh, several different methods. They could use uh, um, uh, rescission or modification. Um, or accord and satisfaction. We'll talk about several different ones, okay? Um, but the, the idea is that if the parties agree uh, to, ex excuse me, if the parties agree to excuse performance, 
um, then, uh, then, then obviously your performance can be excused, right? So that's, that's after the fact. You formed a contract and now it's my time to perform. And for some reason, uh, we agree that my performance will be excused. Now, it could be a number of different reasons. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, you hired me to, to paint your house and your house burned down, right? Um, so we might agree to something else. Or maybe uh, we decided to paint. Uh, you, you hired me to paint your house. And you decided you just don't want your house painted anymore. Uh, but maybe you can have me do something else, right? Or um, maybe we just agree to go our separate ways. Or maybe you agree to pay me a little bit, but then I don't have to do the whole thing. I, there, there could be any number of reasons. Or, or maybe it's because I've already breached the contract, right? And, and then rather than suing me, uh, we come to some kind, of, some kind of agreement to change that. All right. Let's talk about four main ways, though, uh, to discharge perform to discharge your duty to perform uh, by agreement. These would be um, a rescission, uh, modification, accord and satisfaction, and ovation. Those are the four we're going to talk about. Okay, so let's talk about the first one: rescission. Rescission is a mutual agreement by the parties. Let me stop right there. Don't even finish the sentence. It is a mutual agreement by the parties to cancel. A, a, a bilateral contract, okay? Um, and remember, remember there's some bilateral and unilateral, bi uh, meaning uh, bilateral, meaning two-sided, unilateral, meaning uh, one-sided. And remember, um, every contract has to have at least two sides. Uh, so we remember that a, a bilateral contract is a contract where uh, a promise is exchanged for a promise, right? Whereas a unilateral contract is a promise exchanged for performance, right? The, the example we used was, I promise to pay you $500 if you promise to pay my house, paint my house. That's a bilateral contract. We exchanged promise for promise. And once you promise to paint my house in exchange for 500 bucks, then we have a contract. And if you don't show up to paint my house, I can sue you for breach. If I don't pay you the 500 bucks, you can sue me for breach, right? A unilateral contract would be, if you paint my house, then I will pay you $500, right? I'm not asking you to promise. You don't even have to say anything. You can just walk off. Uh, but if you show up and you paint my house, then I owe you $500, right? And, and remember, we would talk about a unilateral contract as being, as being executory. A unilateral contract is not completely formed. It's not binding yet until it is accepted by performance, right? In, in a bilateral contract, we accept through offer and acceptance. You make an offer, you, you make an offer, I accept it. We have a contract in a in a unilateral contract. You make an offer, and I accept it by performance. All right. So harder to have rescission with a unilateral contract because one side because a unilateral contract is, is still executory. It's not formed until one side performs, and once one side performs, it's hard to have a mutual agreement to undo the contract. Right. So if if I promise to paint your house in exchange for your promise to pay me $500, and before I get there to paint the house, we agree, hey, let's just set this aside, right? I, I don't have time to paint your house. You don't have the money to pay me. Uh, let's just call the whole thing off, right? Then that is a rescission. We have mutually agreed to rescind the contract, all right? Um, now, what if... Um, um, uh, if we have a unilateral contract, and I've already performed, right? Well, then that makes it a lot harder uh, because I've already painted the house. We can't just mutually agree to unpaint the house, right? So, so rescission is usually a mutual agreement by the parties uh, to cancel a bilateral contract, right? Um, now, you can still have rescission with a unilateral contract, but then it's, it's one-sided, right? If I um, if I offer, uh, I, I make the promise, I will pay you $500 if you paint my house. That's a unilateral contract. Well, now that doesn't require two people to rescind. I can just take back the offer, right? Um, we might think of that as a, as a one-sided rescission, right? Or another way to think of that would be, remember, if you go back to offer and acceptance, an offer can always be revoked until it's accepted, right? And we had a few caveats. There were a few things that could make an offer binding, but general, the general rule was an offer could always be taken back. An offer could always be rescinded, right? We use the same word. Uh, an offer could always be rescinded until it was accepted. So uh, I would think of that more in the, a unilateral contract. I would think more of in the terms of offer and acceptance, right? You made the offer and then before it was accepted, you rescinded. Um, as opposed to a, a bilateral rescission of a contract where you have an exchange of promises, then both parties have to agree, okay? Both parties have to agree. One side can't get out of a contract all by himself. That's rescission, all right, rescission. Rescission is just 
let's take the contract back. Let's throw it away. Let's let, let's uh, let's do away with it. Um, similar to rescission would be modification. Okay, modification. Um, um, modification is kind of like a rescission in that it requires uh, it requires a mutual agreement. It is a, a modification is a change in a contract by mutual agreement. So rescission is just tearing up the contract by mutual agreement. Modification is changing the contract by mutual agreement. Okay, um, so um, uh, uh, modification would just be if both sides agree to change the contract, then then you can do that. You can think about it, that as a, as a, a modification of the contract, right? I was going to paint your house for five. I was going to paint your house red for five hundred bucks. Um, now I'm going to now we, we agree that I'm going to paint your house blue for five hundred bucks. Um, my performance to paint your house red has been excused. It's been substituted with my uh, my obligation to paint your house blue, um, but but that still has excused at least part of my performance. Uh, the modification could look different, right? Instead of painting your whole house for five hundred dollars, I just paint your back shed, right? Um, so my my obligation to paint your house has been excused. And I have a much smaller obligation. Maybe that maybe we modify your obligation too. I was going to paint your whole house for five hundred bucks. Now I'm going to paint your shed for hundred dollars. That would be a modification. All right. Um, one thing I want to warn you about on modifications. Okay. Uh, first of all, modifications require mutual consent, right? Both parties have to agree to it. But second, the courts often look at modifications as a separate contract, right? A, a modification is uh, an attempt to modify a contract is just another contract, right? Uh, we had a contract. Now we're going to have a contract to modify that contract. All right. And when you think of it that way, then I want you to remember to go back to first principles. Remember that every contract um, has those four or five basic requirements that we've been talking about all semester, right? It requires, um, you know, an agreement uh, and it requires a consideration, right? Remember, every contract requires consideration. So a modification of an existing contract, I want you to remember, typically requires consideration. It requires consideration on both sides. Uh, what do I mean? Well, I mean, both sides have to both give and get something. And they have to both give and get something new, something they weren't already entitled to under the contract, all right? Um, that may sound like I'm making it too complicated, but let me show you how that comes up. Um, I agree to paint your house for $500. You pay me the $500. You really want your house painted. Maybe you, you, you're, you're about to list it for sale. It really needs to look nice because you're going to be asking top dollar. And you've already paid me the 500 bucks and you've got a, a, an open house set for next week. And I come up and I say, you know what? Labor's pretty tight right now. And I know we have a contract, but I don't think I can do it for 500 bucks. I'm going to need a cool grant. I'm going to need a cool thousand dollars to paint your house. And you're like, well, man, I, you know, we agreed to 500. I, I, I have to have it painted. Uh, it's got to be painted by next week. And I say, well, you know, I've already got your money. So uh, you can pay me an extra 500 to paint your house or you can sue me, you know, hire a lawyer to get your 500 bucks back. Maybe you'll get it. Is it worth hiring a lawyer for $500? I don't know. It kind of seems like a shakedown, doesn't it? And so maybe you say, okay, okay, you've got me over the barrel. I'll, I'll agree to pay you $1,000 to paint my house. Um, but I'm not falling for that tree. You paint the house and then I'll give you the second 500 bucks. So I say, okay, I, you know, I've got you. I've successfully blackmailed you. And so I paint the house and then I come to you for the extra $500. And you say, nope, sorry, sucker. We had a contract to, to paint this house for 500 bucks. And then I sue you. And I say, yeah, but we modified that contract. We modified it to, to $1,000. And you can say, no, 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 no. That modification wasn't supported by consideration. You were getting something extra. You were getting an extra $500, but I wasn't getting anything extra. You weren't, get, I, I was paying more, but I wasn't getting more. You were getting more, but you weren't paying more. So that modification, that attempted modification is not valid because there wasn't consideration on both sides. Okay, so you have to be careful of that uh, because sometimes those attempts to modify a contract are really kind of a shakedown, right? It's an attempt by one party to renegotiate. Um, and um, sometimes that's legitimate, sometimes it is not. Uh, but be aware that in order for a modification to be um, uh, uh, to be uh, um, uh, to be enforceable, it has to be supported by independent consideration on both sides. That means you have to be getting something new, something you weren't entitled to before. Now, 
Let me also remind you back to our first or second week of class uh, uh, that, that can, when we talked about a peppercorn, right? Even before we talked about consideration, we talked about this idea of a peppercorn, that the court's not going to weigh consideration. The court's not going to say, did you get your money's worth? It's just going to look at, did you get what you asked for? Did you get what you bargained for? So that, that new consideration to support the modification doesn't have to be a lot, but there has to be something, okay? There has to be something. Um, maybe labor costs really have gone up and the cost of paint uh, doubled overnight and you really can't afford to paint this house without a th for $1,000. And so it's not that you're trying to shake the guy down. It's really the, the, the prices have doubled. You can't afford to do it for $500. And maybe he sees that. Maybe you're by, you're, you're the party on the side sees that and they want to be reasonable. And they're like, okay, yeah, I'll agree to pay more. Well, great. But if you're going to do that, I suggest that you add one more thing to the pot to make sure that there's consideration to support that modification. Okay. So if you go to your, you go to the, your client and you say, Hey, it's going to cost extra. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's going to cost extra 500 bucks. And if they agree to it, you better agree to do one extra thing. Right. And I'll also paint your front door and I'll also paint your mailbox. And I'll also, um, and I'll also give you this, this pin, right? Uh, you'll pay me an extra 500 bucks and I'll give you this pin, this highlighter. Um, is that highlighter worth 500 bucks? No, but it's sure worth a peppercorn. And that might be the one thing that saves your attempted modification, okay? I see that happen time and time again. And I've seen a ton of contract lawsuits come up where the parties legitimately intended to modify a contract. They legitimately intended to raise the price or or somebody had already paid, and so the and they agreed for the other side just to do less, right? Uh, well, I've already paid, and you're supposed to 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 uh, you know, I've already paid, and you're supposed to paint my lawn and uh, paint the back fence, uh, but we'll agree that you only paint. Uh, I'm sorry, did I say paint my lawn? That doesn't make sense. I've already paid for you to paint my house and the back fence, um, but you've painted the house, and now you've run out of time, you've run out of money, whatever. And I say, okay, let, let's modify the contract. We'll excuse the the painting of the back fence, right? Well. Again, we're, we're back to one side is getting something. You're having to do less, but I'm not getting any more. Uh, so if you're going to modify that contract, make sure there is at least some kind of change in consideration. Um, and my suggestion is always add something. Add something small. That way we're sure that there's consideration on both sides. That way we're sure that that, that attempted modification is going to be a second enforceable contract. Okay, So that would be modification where you change a contract. Uh, the, the third type is what's called an accord and satisfaction, an accord and satisfaction, okay? Um, an accord and satisfaction is where the parties agree to substitute one type of performance for another, and then the satisfaction is actually then doing that, second, that, that, that subsequent performance, right? Um, so an accord and satisfaction might be... Um, uh, you agreed to sell me your Camaro for $20,000 and I paid, but when I get there, you don't have a Camaro, so I'll take the Tahoe, right? That's an accord and satisfaction. Um, you didn't have the Camaro, but we agreed to a, you were supposed to give me a Camaro, but we agreed to a substitute performance. We agreed to substitute a Tahoe for a Camaro, right? Um, and then you satisfied by giving me the Tahoe, an accord and satisfaction. Um, you got to be real careful with accords and satisfaction. Uh, because what does accord and satisfaction look like? Well, oftentimes, I, I just spent way too long warning you just a minute ago. A lot of times, an accord and satisfaction can look an awful lot like an attempt to modify a contract without consideration, okay? So you got to be real careful with accord and satisfactions. Now, we see accord, there's, a lot of times there's a legit, there's legit uses for accord and satisfaction just in every day. Like, you know, we, didn't, we don't have the Camaros when it was time to deliver your car, and so or we'll deliver a Tahoe. Um, but a lot of times, accord and satisfaction comes up um, when we're already talking about maybe even threatening lawsuits, right? We've already got a breach of a contract. In fact, that example just there, um, you were supposed to deliver a Camaro, and when I got there, you didn't have a Camaro. You are now, you're in breach of the contract, or you're about to breach the contract because you can't deliver the Camaro. Um, and so a lot of times, accord and satisfactions um, come up either when uh, when the parties are, are, are about, to, they can see a breach coming, right? And they're, they're, the contract is about to be breached. They're trying to find a way around it. Or when a contract has already been breached and they're trying to resolve that, 
right? They're, they're trying to find a way through that. Maybe it's uh, maybe they haven't filed suit yet, so it's not a it's not quite a settlement agreement, but it's almost a settlement agreement. Or or maybe suit has been filed, and, and your accord and satisfaction is 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 a legit settlement agreement. Um, you have to be careful with accord and satisfaction because again, um, you know if um, uh, if only one side is, is if you're only changing what one side has to do. Uh, then you always run the risk of it looking a lot like um, a lot like a, a modification that's not supported by consideration. Why does that matter? Because you don't want to think that you may, you don't want to think that you reach an, an accord and satisfaction, and then you perform, and then the other side sues you anyway, right? Uh, you want to make sure that you have a valid accord and satisfaction. So, if you're going to enter, enter into a settlement agreement. Um, uh, or a pre-settlement agreement. Uh, it's always good to, you know, you call it by its terms, put accord and satisfaction right at the top, right? Uh, that way the, the, the court knows, if somebody sues on it, the court knows that there's more there uh, than just changing the performance on one side. Another thing you can do is put in there that, you know, hey, I'm thinking about suing you, um, or I did sue you, right? And so in exchange for this court accord and satisfaction, I'm also releasing the lawsuit against you, right? Um, that may be extra consideration, uh, but don't just assume that, uh, that that the right to, that giving up the right to sue somebody is going to appear on the face of the contract. Either make it very explicit, call it according to call it according to satisfaction, or remember my advice from a modif from the modification. Right, even if you think it's a perfectly valid according satisfaction, even if you think right on its face. Um, it's clear that a court will see this as a valid accord and satisfaction. You know, I'm, um, you know, you failed to deliver the Camaro, and so I was going to sue you, um, but you gave me a Tahoe. So in exchange, I gave you release from the lawsuit, um, something like that. Um, make sure my, my advice is still treat that like a modification. Make sure you add something, a little something extra that the other side wasn't entitled to before in order to make sure that they can't come back and say, no, this wasn't an accord and satisfaction, Judge. This was, this was one of those shakedowns. This was an attempt to modify without consideration. Okay, but that's accord and satisfaction. The, again, the accord is where you agree that the parties mutually agree to substitute one performance for the other. And then the satisfaction is actually performing uh, that, that, that new substituted performance. And that would satisfy the contract and that would excuse whatever the original performance was, okay? Accord and satisfaction. We see that a lot of times in, in, in settlement agreements or, or pre-settlement agreements, right? You've already breached the contract, so before I sue you, what can you do to make me happy? Um, accord and satisfaction, all right? Uh, the last one we're gonna talk about as far as um, discharge by agreement is something called a novation, a novation, okay? Uh, nova, uh, I always encourage you all to, to try to break down the words, see what they're, um, see what their etymology is, right? Where, does they where, where do they come from? Sometimes that helps you understand what they mean. And, and, and a novation um, comes from a, a nova, right? Um, um, a nova is a, uh, it'd be Latin for like a new birth, right? You all know what, you've heard of a, no a supernova, right? A supernova is when an old star collapses and it explodes into a new star. Uh, so a novation is, is a rebirth of something new. And that's exactly what a novation of a contract is. Um, a novation, is, is where um, the, the parties have attempted to modify the contract so much that basically that old contract has collapsed and exploded into a new contract, right? We have substituted an entirely new contract for the old contract, um, a novation. So basically uh, a novation agreement is, is almost like a rescission and a new agreement. We're, we're throwing out the old agreement and we're substituting the, the, this whole new agreement. Um, that, that new agreement might have um, uh, might have different uh, different uh, considerations, right? Different things that the parties have to perform. It may even have different parties. Maybe it's got all new parties, like right. Uh, me and you uh, agreed that I would buy your car, you know, your uh, um, Volkswagen for five hundred bucks. Um, but uh, then we decided, well, actually, I'm not going to buy your Volkswagen. I'm going to buy your brother's. Um, you know, I'm going to buy your your brother's Malibu. Um, and, uh, well, then I'm not going to buy your brother's Malibu for 500. I'm going to buy it for a thousand. And then, well, actually, I'm not going to buy it. My, uh, my sister's going to buy your brother's Malibu for a thousand dollars. Well, my sister buying your brother's Malibu for a thousand dollars has gone way beyond me buying your Volkswagen for 500 bucks, right? We've, we've, we've entered into a novation. We've, we've, we've thrown out that old contract and substituted in a new one. Um, why is it important? Uh, well, we don't, 
We don't often call our contracts novation agreements. Sometimes we do when we want to be really, really clear. Um, but the reason you want to be able to identify a novation, a lot of times it comes up after the fact, right? Uh, the parties have agreed to modify an agreement. Um, and then they go along and they're performing. And then one of the parties sues the other party for some requirement that was in the old document, right? And then there may be some dispute about, well, were we just amending the contract? And th did some of those old requirements remain? Or were we completely replacing the old contract with the new contract, right? Um, if we're completely replacing the old contract with the new contract, then that is a novation. And if you're doing that, you may even want to title that contract Novation Agreement to make it clear that we're throwing out all of the obligations in the old contract and we're replacing them with this new one. So don't come back later and sue me for some other thing that was in that other contract that we forgot to modify. Okay, so that would be a novation. A novation is where we substitute one contract with a whole new contract. All right, so uh, we've got rescission where the parties mutually agree to just throw out the contract before they, even, before they ever really start. There's modification uh, where the parties may mutually agree to change, you know, one or more uh, obligations. Um, remember, uh, a modification must be supported by independent consideration. Uh, we have the accord and satisfaction where we agree to substitute one performance for another performance. And then when you actually do that other performance, that satisfies the contract um, and excuses the old required performance. And then lastly, we have a novation where you throw out the entire old contract and you replace it with an entirely new contract. Okay, that would be a novation. Um, all right, so um, Performance, that's what we're talking about. And we're talking about ways to excuse performance. The first one, if you're going through my lecture notes, I hope you're looking at those, was discharge due to unmet conditions. The second was discharge, due, uh, discharge by agreement. Uh, the third category we're going to talk about is discharge by operation of law. Okay, discharge by operation of law. Um, sometimes uh, the, the law may simply excuse performance. Um, uh, we entered into a contract. I agreed, you agreed, you know, you performed. Um, and I was planning to perform, uh, you want me to perform, but, um, but for some reason, the law excuses my performance. Um, this can generally be classified as, an opera, as, uh, as excused by the operation of law, okay? Uh, what are some kinds of laws that would excuse performance? Well, um, typically uh, death or incapacity, if one of the parties dies, that typically excuses their performance, although not always, you gotta be careful. Uh, if they become incapacitated, that may excuse their performance, but not always, so be careful. Um, talk about those in just a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, insolvency, what are we talking about there? We're talking about bankruptcy, okay? Uh, bankruptcy. Um, if, if the debtor, uh, if the person who owes an obligation files a bankruptcy, uh, then their further performances uh, may be excused by operation of law. Um, and there's other circumstances, sometimes under the law, that, that may... Um, uh, that make things uh, excusable by operation of law. Let's look at them, uh, let's look at them one at a time. Uh, death or incapacity by one of the contracting parties. Um, if the contract calls for a personal performance, okay, then the death or incapacity of one of the parties uh, would make that performance impossible, right? Uh, if you hire me to represent you in your criminal lawsuit, I can't do that if I die before your lawsuit, right? And if I die before your criminal case, then you can't sue me for breach of contract because my performance is excused due to that impossibility, right? Uh, and and that's, it. That, that's an excuse as a matter of law. Um, or what if I just become incompetent, right? Um, you, you had hired me to, uh, to be a, um, a manager. You'd hired me to paint your picture, whatever. You'd hired me to do something and I become incompetent. I can't do it anymore. Um, then my uh, performance is excused by operation of law due to my incapacity. Uh, we can think of death as just the ultimate incapacity, right? Um, now, if you've already paid, does that mean you can't sue my estate for your money back? Not necessarily. We'll talk about um, we'll talk about uh, uh, remedies next week. Uh, but in general, it does mean you can't sue me for breach of contract. You might be able to sue me for restitution or something like money hadn't received. You may have a suit in equity, right? In fairness, judge, I know I can't sue him for breach of contract, but but at least make him give me my money back. And you could sue my estate, um, but it wouldn't be a breach of contract because my performance is excused by operation of law. Now, remember, that only applies to things where the contract is, is for something like a, 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 
a personal performance, right? A, a personal obligation. If it's something that your estate could still follow through on, well, then it's not excused. Like if we have a contract to, you know, I've got a, um, I've got a classic '60s Jaguar, and you and you've already and you all and you've always wanted one, so you've you've uh, um, you got a contract to buy it from me for hundred thousand dollars, and you think that's a sweet deal because you think it's worth double that, and then I die. Uh, but you really want that car, and you really want it for hundred thousand dollars because you thought you got a great deal. Is there any reason my estate can't follow through on that contract? No, that's not a, a personal performance. The estate could still sell you the car; they could still take the money. Um, so in that kind of situation, um, uh, performance would not be excused. So if it's something that the estate can do uh, reasonably, logically, uh, then death or incapacity wouldn't necessarily excuse performance. But when it is a personal act, uh, when there's something uh, peculiarly or particularly personal about uh, the required performance, then performance can be excused by death or incapacity uh, as a matter of law, okay? Uh, so discharge by operation of law. Now, be careful. You can get into gray areas, right? Um, uh, a promise to sell a car, not personal, right? My estate can definitely do that. Um, a promise to paint your portrait, right? Obviously, very personal. Uh, you know, if you hire Picasso to paint your portrait, you want Picasso to paint your portrait, not Professor Watson. He's not a very good painter. Um, so you hire Picasso to paint your portrait, that's probably, and he dies, that's probably excused. Um, but what if you hired Joe's house painting to paint your house and Joe dies? Um, house painting is painting. So is that more like Picasso or is that more like selling a car? Um, and the answer is I don't have a good answer for you, right? That would depend on the facts of the situation. It's the kind of thing you might want to be aware of. That's the kind of thing that you might have to go to litigation to find out. Is that a personal service that is excused or not? Or maybe the parties could work it out uh, through a modification or an ovation or one of those other things we learned, right? That's discharge uh, by operation of law because of um, death or incapacity. Uh, the second one, very important. I don't care if you decide to go into a litigation practice or not. Uh, this is something that every legal professional, um, every business person, um, every, every person who might hold a debt against somebody else, even every individual uh, potential debtor should be aware of, and that's a discharge by insolvency. And by insolvency, we mean bankruptcy bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is governed by federal law. Bankruptcy is a right. Let me say it again. Bankruptcy is a right of every American citizen, and in fact, even potentially non-citizens, okay? Bankruptcy is, is an old proceeding in the United States, and it is a way to protect debtors from abusive collection efforts, to free them from accumulated debt, and let them start over, to let them again, possibly become productive members of society. Um, a little bit of history lesson, right? Let's, let, let's think of where this came from. Um, some of the, when, when the, the European settlers were coming to the, 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 the Americas, uh, they were coming from England. And one of the things they were fleeing were some abusive practices like, uh, like debtor's prisons, right? Read a little Charles Dickens. Find out about these, these poor urchins or these people who, who lost every, who, who couldn't pay their debts. And so they were, uh, the banks took everything they had, took their clothes, took the shoes on their feet, left them and their families out on the street, homeless, begging, right? Um, that's not productive. How does that, how does that guy, how does that family, how does that person ever become productive again if they don't even have shoes, they don't have clothes to wear? How can they ever get a job and become um, a productive part of society again? And is that really what we want? Do we want to be throwing people out on the street just to, 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 um, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, um, subject to the weather and, and, and just to, uh, um, uh, just to fend for themselves. No, it's not productive. We're a civilized society. And so bankruptcy um, gives those people a way to, to reset their debts, to pay what they can, to save at least what the law thinks is, is a minimal amount so that they can then reset and go on with their lives and start anew without those debts. It washes the debts clean, okay? Um, and when you wash those debts clean, what are you doing? You are excusing performance, okay? Excusing performance. Uh, further abuse in, in England, they had debtors' prisons, right? If you didn't pay your debts, you could be put in jail. Uh, we don't do that in the United States. If you can't pay your debts, you can't be put in jail for, for failure to pay a debt. Failure to pay a debt is not a crime. Um, and you can't take 
Um, you can't take somebody's uh, uh, last clothes. You can't take the last piece, you know, the last bit of food out of the refrigerator. You can't take their Bible and their fa- their family heirlooms, right? Those things that that aren't that have absolutely no value to the creditors. You only take them to 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 be a jerk, right? To put to put pressure on the debtor. Um, uh, bankruptcy uh, gives us all a um, a valid way around. There's two types of bankruptcy, basically. Uh, really, uh, you know, a bankruptcy uh, um, uh, practitioner would tell you there's actually four or five or six. Uh, but in general, there's two types of bankruptcy. There's there's liquidation and then there's reorganization. Now, you can have liquidation for individuals and reorganization for individuals versus liquidation for a, a company or, or um reorganization for a company. Those would be, you know, four different categories. For our purposes, this isn't a bankruptcy class. We can talk about those as basically the two types of bankruptcies, okay? Uh, the first uh, type of bankruptcy would be a liquidation. Uh, we, that's chapter seven, right? If somebody files a bankruptcy for a chapter seven, uh, they, they, they tell the court, look, I am bankrupt. And, and what is the, the basic definition of bankrupt is? My obligations exceed my assets. So if you have more debt than you have assets, you are bankrupt. Um, yes, I know a lot of you are like, wait a minute, that means we're all bankrupt. Yeah, well, a lot of us are technically bankrupt. Our, um, our debts exceed our assets, especially you know, when you're starting out and you're young, you buy a house and you buy a car and you got a great job um, and maybe you're living like a millionaire, right? Because you've got that stream of income that can support it. But technically, if your assets exceed your debts, you are bankrupt, all right? Um, and if you, you don't have to file bankruptcy, but if you choose to file bankruptcy, you can file a chapter seven. And then a chapter seven, what the court does is, and this is the part that everybody needs to be aware of. The second a debtor files a bankruptcy, um, then the federal bankruptcy law uh, uh, establishes what is called the automatic stay, the automatic stay. And it comes down like an iron curtain. There is no violating the automatic stay. If someone files a bankruptcy, then creditors, anybody who, who has a, a debt or a contractual obligation, you better stop. Um, you better stop because now the only way to resolve your debt, once that automatic stay is in place, and again, it's automatic. The second it's filed, it's automatic. If you want to try to enforce your debt, you want to try to enforce your contractual obligation, you have to do it through the bankruptcy court. Okay, Remember, this is about giving, uh, giving a, a debtors relief. Um, don't you dare violate that automatic stay. Uh, we have special bankruptcy courts, bankruptcy judges, and all they do is bankruptcy, and they take their job very seriously, and they get very jealous over their jurisdiction. And God help you if you knowingly go around violating the automatic stay. Uh, somebody owes you money, they file a bankruptcy, you call them on the phone and you say, hey, I know you filed bankruptcy, but you better pay me that money. You better hope he doesn't have that conversation recorded, because if they prove that, the bankruptcy judge can throw you in jail, throw you in jail for contempt of court, okay? So be aware of that automatic stay. The second somebody files a bankruptcy, before you contact them or do anything else, you better talk to a bankruptcy lawyer and see the right way to do it because you do not want to get thrown in jail for contempt for violating that automatic stay, all right? But uh, let's get back to chapter seven. Somebody files a chapter seven bankruptcy. What they're telling the judge is, Look, my assets, they, they, they outweigh my, uh, uh, they're outweighed by my debts and I need a fresh start judge. The automatic stay comes down like a hammer. That means that all their creditors have to stop trying to collect from them. If they've got a claim, they can file it in bankruptcy court. Uh, the bankruptcy court is then going to appoint a bankruptcy trustee who is going to take all the assets of the debtor, right? They're going to take all the assets of the debtor and they're going to make a determination about which of those assets are exempt. That means under bankruptcy law, the debtor gets to keep them free of debts and which of their assets are, are non-exempt. And they're going to give the exempt assets back to the debtor. The non-exempt assets, they're going to sell. And then they're going to pay all of the creditors equally in, in an equal percentage, whatever pennies on the dollar. So if you've got a million dollars worth of debt and you only have $100,000 worth of non-exempt assets, uh, then each of your creditors is gonna get 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, oftentimes, uh, creditors get way less than 10 cents on the dollar. They get two cents on the dollar or one cent on the dollar or nothing on the dollar because you're, you know, you really have no assets if you've gotten to the point where you filed bankruptcy. That happens a lot. All right. Uh, the result, though, is the, the bankruptcy trustee um, gives you back your non-exempt assets, takes your exempt assets and sells them off, uses that money to pay your creditors as much as they can, and then your debts are discharged and your contractual obligations are discharged. That means 
performance has been excused by operation of the law, right? Performance has been excused by bankruptcy law. So um, if you sell somebody a car for $100,000, uh, you got some you know, fancy Maserati and you sell it to somebody for $100,000 and they're going to pay you every month and they pay you the first 50, but then they file bankruptcy, um, you may be in trouble, Jack, um, because uh, you cannot go to them and try to get that extra 50. It, the, the bankruptcy court's going to take their assets, pay all their creditors equally, um, and then give them a discharge as long as they do everything right. And if that means you only get paid two cents on the dollar for what's left, uh, then you're out of luck. That's all you're going to get because their further performance has been discharged by operation of law. Okay. Now, bankruptcy gets a lot more technical than that. There are some things like when we grant um, uh, when we grant security interest in things, the debtors may be able to uh, their debt may be waived, but they may still get to take their security interest. So um, if I've got a mortgage on your house and you file bankruptcy. You either got to keep paying that mortgage or I get the house. Now, if the house is not enough to pay off the debt, that's all I get is, is the house. I don't get any extra. Um, but um, uh, so secured creditors treated a little bit different. Obviously, there's a lot of nuances, a lot of technicalities to bankruptcy, but that would be a chapter seven. Okay. And chapter seven is where a debtor comes in, um, keeps their exempt assets, gives the bank their non uh, gives the trustee their non exempt assets, the trustee sells the non exempt assets, pays off their debtors all equally. And then the rest of their obligations are discharged, all right? Their, their performance is discharged by operation of law. Uh, second type of bankruptcy is a chapter 13, and that's a reorganization. That's where a debtor uh, goes into the court and says, hey, judge, I, I, I'm going to try to pay these creditors, but you know they're all clamoring so much that I need help right now. I need you to, to again, bring down that automatic stay and give me a little extra time, right? So let's say I run a factory. And I can't make the payment on one of my notes. And so one of my creditors wants to come in and take all my machines. But if they take all my machines, then I'm out of business. If, I, if I'm out of business, then I can't pay anybody else, right? And I can't pay this guy. Um, but I go in and say, judge those machines, if I can just stay in business, if you can just give me a pause on my payments, then I can put together a plan of how I'm going to do business, uh, how I'm going to make money, how I'm going to try to pay everybody um, and, and get back on my feet and get back in, in good standing. Okay, so a chapter 13, again, um, you still have that automatic stay, comes down like a hammer, an iron curtain, don't you dare violate it. Um, but then instead of just selling off your assets and, and paying off your debts, uh, the debtor gets to keep his assets and they put together a plan, um, a plan that has to be approved by the court, a plan that their creditors, you know, they get a say in, but uh, a way that maybe they can extend their debts. You know, maybe they can say, look, judge, if you'll just I know I've got a balloon payment that's all due now, but if you can extend this debt, then I can pay it off over three years, right? And that way I can stay in business. I can pay everybody else and everybody is better off. Um, plans, again, usually have to be approved by the court. Uh, the creditors get a say in it, um, but the court, bankruptcy court has the power to, to cram that down the throats of the creditors sometimes. Uh, they can say, look, I'm, I, I know you don't want to pay out over three years, um, but nobody's going to get anything the other way, right, with, with the, with the uh, liquidation. And so I think this plan is better for everyone. Um, and, so, and so this is what we're going to do. Now, in those circumstances, um, the, the court can reduce the debt as well. They can, they can stretch out the payment and reduce debt. So instead of getting $100,000 on your balloon payment today, because the debtor doesn't have $100,000, uh, but we're going to give you, he's going to pay off you know, $30,000 a year over three years, that's $90,000. And at the end, we're just going to forgive the rest if he completes the plan, okay? So that they can do both. They can extend payments. They can, they can bring down amounts, but it has to be part of a plan. It has to be approved by the court. And then the debtor has to actually succeed with the plan. Um, if you file a chapter 13, if the court approves the plan, if you succeed with the plan, then any further performance is discharged by operation of law, by operation of those bankruptcy laws, okay? So uh, quick crack, uh, that's a really crash course in bankruptcy, chapter seven, liquidation, chapter 13, um, but that is discharged by operation of law with uh, the, by the laws of insolvency, okay? By the way, always federal law. Bankruptcy law is always federal law. It can be influenced by state law. Um, but uh, it is always a matter of federal courts, federal bankruptcy courts, and federal law, okay? Um, next category, uh, th th there are other laws besides insolvency, besides that, that death and incapacity that may excuse performance. Um, uh, for example, um, 
uh, take a look at the Texas property code, right? And the property codes in many states, and there's even a federal law on it. If, um, if a, a service member is called to active duty, right, uh, they may be excused from the remainder of a lease, right? So if you are, uh, let's say you're in the Army Reserves and you get called up and sent to Afghanistan, but you've got a lease on an apartment, right? Um, the, the law, we have specific laws that would excuse you. You say, no, if, if he goes to Afghanistan, sorry, landlord, that's a valid you know, military order. He's got to go. Uh, you got to let him out of the lease, okay? Um, so that would be that'd be another type of law that might excuse performance. Uh, you signed a contract to pay uh, you know pay the rent every month for twelve months, uh, but after three months you went off to Afghanistan. The law is going to excuse the remainder of that performance by operation of law. All right. Um, th there may even be public policy, right? Public policy. If you ever hear public policy, it means that the court doesn't have a really good explanation for why they're doing it, but uh, but in this. The grand scheme of public policy, uh, something would, would tend to make the contract unenforceable. Um, if there's some kind of public policy uh, that would make the, the contract un unenforceable, then, um, uh, then the parties may be allowed to rescind the contract, right? Um, you may have to give the money back if, if you've already been paid, but if there's some public policy uh, that makes the contract now unenforceable, um, uh, then that may be a discharge um, by operation of law. Uh, another category. Um, if if one side prevents the other side from performance, right? You can't, you, you know, you you know somebody. Let's say you, you uh, again. Let's use a classic my, my classic Jaguar example. I've got a classic Jag in my garage, and it's worth a hundred thousand uh, dollars. I think it's worth a hundred thousand dollars, and so I sell it to you for a hundred thousand dollars. And you're supposed to pay me on Friday, um, but on Thursday I get another offer to sell it to somebody else for two hundred thousand dollars. I you know, I, I don't want to take your hundred thousand dollars. I want to sell it to him for two, but I don't want to sell it to him for two and then have you sue me. So you know what I can do? I could interfere with your ability to, to I can make you breach the contract. I could, um, I could hide so you couldn't pay the money. Right. Or I could, uh, I could call your bank and, and, and uh, say, Hey, somebody stole my credit cards. Please freeze my bank account. Right. If that kept you from being able to pay on, on Friday, then I could cause you to breach the contract. And then I might think, aha, now I'm free. Um, I can, um, uh, I can uh, um, sell it to somebody else. Well, if, if one party intentionally prevents the other side from performing, uh, then that may excuse, almost always excuses the, the performance of the innocent party, right? It may also give the innocent party uh, the, um, if their performance is excused, it means they don't have to perform, but it doesn't mean the contract is canceled. They may still be able to enforce the contract. So you gotta be careful. Uh, but if one party prevents the other party uh, from performing, uh, then that may also excuse performance, okay? Uh, so again, uh, we're talking about performance and, and specifically in this chapter, we're talking about circumstances that might excuse performance. Uh, we've been going for about an hour. So why don't we stop there and split this up into two recordings so a little more manageable. Um, when we come back, we will start talking about um, impossibility, and then we'll talk about uh, a prior breach, like if the other side breaches the contract first, that might excuse performance, okay? Uh, so I will, uh, I'll stop the recording here, and I will see you on the next one. Um,